I'll begin. So uh, this is uh, some. I'm going to talk about some work I had done a couple of years ago. Um, it's a generalization of uh, the notion of the plactic monoid, which is a monoid uh, formed by some rewriting relations on uh, words to the setting of timed words. So, um, so let me just uh, start uh, at the very beginning and recall a little bit about the plactic monoid itself. So to begin with, uh, we'll start with just the monoid of words. Okay, by the way, if you have any questions at any point, just unmute yourself and you know, ask away. Um, okay, so let's start with the monoid of words. So we're going to have an alphabet, uh, AN, which is the letters 1 to N, the numbers 1 to N. Uh, we'll think of it as an ordered alphabet. So the order is very important here. And the monoid of words is just, uh, you know, all words in this alphabet. So a word is just a sequence of numbers or letters in the alphabet. And uh, this word here, a1 dot 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 al, is a word of length l. There's also the word of uh, length zero, uh, the empty word. And the product on this monoid is the concatenation of words. So you just write one word next to another, and that's concatenation. So the unit in this monoid is the empty word, which I'll denote by uh, this empty set symbol. And uh, given a word, you can talk about its subwords. So if a word is uh, of the form a1, a2, dot, 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 al, then a subword is a word of the form ai1, ai2, dot, 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 aik, where uh, uh, 1 is less than or equal to i1, strictly less than i2, strictly less than ik less than or equal to L. Okay, so that's all sort of uh, fairly uh, obvious uh, terminology. Um, and now the problem uh, where the story begins somehow maybe uh, is the longest increasing subword problem. So uh, what is the problem? You're given a word, it may be really long, uh, a very long word, and uh, you want to determine the length of the longest increasing subword of this word. Okay, so that's the problem. And uh, you can add another rule, which is that you're only allowed to read this word once from left to right. And as you do that, you can take notes and record things and so on, but you're not allowed, once you've read a certain letter, you're not allowed to go back and read the word again. And uh, uh, Shenstead, came up with a very beautiful one-pass algorithm for this. So the idea of Shenstead's algorithm is, well, read the word from left to right, and at each stage, you have, you'd have read a certain part of the word. So at that stage, so we say you've read the first 10 uh, letters of the uh, word. Amri, so, Amri, uh, yes? when you say uh, you can take notes, that is uh, giving too much freedom, right? I could just keep uh, keep keep a copy of the word oh yeah yeah so let's see um yeah you're right so i need to be more careful here uh yeah so you don't want to store uh, so let's see okay so we'll just see the algorithm you're absolutely right Raghavan. yeah let's keep it vague yeah 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 it's okay yeah yeah um but you're allowed to um yeah so exactly how is this what's the one pass algorithm um yeah maybe uh yeah, let's let's just see how this works. Uh, maybe we can formulate that more precisely. Um, yeah, but but what the notes that Shenstead's algorithm keeps track of is really the least last element of the longest increasing subword of length r for every r. So you'll be keeping track of the least last element of the longest increasing subword of length one. You'll be keeping track of the least last element of the longest increasing subword of length two, and so on. And at some point, you won't have a longest increasing subword of a certain length, so then you you don't keep track of it. So let's just uh, see this using an example. So we start with this word uh, three five two three two four five one one one, and uh, now we are going to start reading this word. So the first letter we read is three. And so we are going to just keep track. So we are looking at just this word with one letter three. And we are asking, 
what is the least last letter of a sub word of length one of the word of length one, which is three? And the answer to that is, well, it's three. Okay. And of course, this word has length one. It doesn't have any uh, sub words of length two. So the, the information that we record stops there. Okay. Now we read the next letter, five. And what we know already is that the least last letter of a increasing subword of length one is three. And now we have a five that comes after that three. So what we can do is we can append this five to the end of that subword which ended in three. And we would get an increasing subword of length two and its last letter would be five. So now at this stage, after reading the five, we have the following situation. We know that of the word read so far, the least last letter of a subword of length one is three, and the least last letter of a subword of length two is five. Okay, now let's go to the next stage. The next letter that we read is two. So now we ask ourselves, uh, what is the least last letter of a subword of length one? Well, earlier it was three, but now it's two because we have a two in that word. So we, we do have a least. Uh, we have a subword of length one with a last letter two. What about subword of length two? Can we find a subword of length two with last letter? Well, we uh, we know that there is one with last letter five. Can we improve that really? Well, no, because this two came too late, right? So, so the least last letter of a subword of length one is three. You cannot add a two after that to get an increasing subword of length two. So, so we're okay. So I hope this is clear what I'm doing. If, if there's any, if I sometimes, I, you know, I don't say what I meant to say, but we're looking for the least last letter of increasing subwords of each length. So what we have at this stage is we have been able to decrease the least last letter of an increasing subword of length one from three to two. And so we throw away that three. We don't need it anymore. But for uh, subwords of length two, the least last letter remains five. And now we have a three. So what do you think will happen? So, so for a subword of length one, it's still the least last letter is two. For a subword of length two, do we have an improvement? So you can unmute and let me know. Yes. Yes. Yeah, right. Why? Because two is all we have a word of length one which ends with two. We can just add the three to the end of that and we'll get a word of length two which ends with three. And uh, but uh, but uh, words of uh, length three, we can't do anything because the least last letter of a word of length two is five. And uh, so somehow this three cannot be added to the end of that to make a word of length. So the five is thrown away and the three comes to replace the five. And we go on like this. So the next word is two. And by now you've kind of would have noticed the pattern that is appearing here. This two is going to replace the first letter in this uh, word that we've already recorded here. Uh, that is strictly greater than two. So this two is going to replace the three. And then the three is going to come and sit at the end of this word of discard. So this W prime is, I'm going to call it the shadow word. And now this four, well, you know, I have a increasing subword of length two, which ends with two. So I can just add the four to the end of it and get a subword of length three. Uh, Amri, just for clarity, you yeah. don't mean to say that W prime is a subword, right? W prime is, I'm not even saying that P is a subword. Uh, oh, W prime is. Oh, uh, yeah. P is uh, not a subword. Yeah, w prime yeah. is not a subword. Yeah, yeah. These are just words. Sorry. Did I. Yeah, if I said subword. No, no, no. You didn't say that, but uh, you didn't say that, but I'm just asking. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't think. Uh, I don't know about. Certainly, P is not a subword. Uh, w prime. No, the five came before the three. Yeah, so. the five came before the three. So now you're getting the hang of it, right? So this. Five is bigger than everything in here, so it'll just go there. This one will replace the first thing that's strictly greater than one, so it'll replace the first two, and the two will get discarded. And then this one will replace the next two, 
and this one will replace the four. So this is what we get at the end of this. So what we know now is that the longest increasing sub word of our original uh, word has length four, and in fact, uh, it has. Uh, uh, you can find one of length four which ends with five. Okay, so this is uh, this is Shenstead's algorithm. But then Shenstead didn't stop here. He took the word W prime, uh, which is the shadow word, uh, three five three two two four, uh, and continued the process. So now we have W prime, and then we continue this process. We put the three, five, and then this five gets knocked down by the three, and then the two knocks down a three, and then the next two knocks down a three, and four, and we get a second shadow word, like the shadow of the shadow. And um, we continue this process again, and we get um, three, three, and then the next shadow word is five. And uh, this time, uh, we just get five and we don't get any shadow word. Okay, so this uh, process, uh, Shenstead arranged uh, in the form of a tableau. And uh, so this um, one, 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 five is the first P that we got, the P of the original word. Two, two, four is the P of the first shadow. Three, three is the P of the second shadow. And uh, five is the P of the third shadow. And this is called the insertion tableau of the word W. So this is all, uh, of course, uh, bread and butter to algebraic combinatorists. Um, and its shape is, uh, well, the number of boxes in each row. So this case, somehow the shape turned out to be rather nice, four, three, two, one. So the four boxes in the first row, three boxes in the second row, two boxes in the third row, and one box in the fourth row. So uh, what we know is that the length of the first row is the length of the longest increasing subword of the original word W. So what is the interpretation of the length of the remaining rows? And this is uh, the, the content of Green's theorem. So um, let me explain Green's theorem now. So you start with the word a1, a2, dot, 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 al. And uh, uh, two subwords u and v, um, well, it depends on how you draw them from w. So if u is a subword, then you pick certain indices i1, i2, ik to form u. And for v, you've picked another bunch of indices to form v. And we say that these two subwords are disjoint if these sets of indices that we can pick these sets of indices to be disjoint. Okay, so I hope this definition is clear. I haven't state in the most precise way, but rather in the intuitive way, that you can pick both these uh, by choosing disjoint sets of indices. Okay, so these are disjoint subwords. And um, so Green's theorem says that suppose uh, W is a word and uh, the insertion tableau of W has shape lambda 1, lambda 2, dot, 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 lambda L. So it's part of this theory that lambda 1 will actually be always greater than or equal to lambda 2, which will always be greater than or equal to lambda 3 and so on. Then for each integer k, lambda, the sum of the first k lambdas, that means the sum of the lengths of the first k rows of, uh, of Pw is the maximum sum of the lengths of k pairwise disjoint weakly increasing subwords. Okay, so I'll, I'll just restate this again. So in terms of what are called green invariants. So given a word W, uh, the kth green invariant is the maximum sum of lengths of K pairwise disjoint weakly increasing subwords. And uh, Green's theorem says that AK is the total number of boxes in the first K rows of the insertion tableau of W. Okay, so in this example here, for example, uh, what you know is that from this word, you can draw two disjoint weakly increasing subwords of total length um, seven and three of total length nine and of course uh, four of total length 
10, which is the size of the word itself. So all the letters in this word can be broken up into four, uh, four weekly increasing subgroups. So, so that's Green's theorem. And uh, let me just uh, recall for you how the proof of Green's theorem goes. So the proof of Green's theorem uses uh, Knuth relations. So these uh, relations, uh, they can also be called Knuth moves or rewriting rules. So we have this free monoid A star and uh, Knuth discovered these rules um, uh, when he was studying Shenstedt's insertion algorithm. And uh, basically uh, there are two of them and uh, they say that if you have a word of the form u, y, x, z, v. So in this u and v are words, y, x and z are letters. Okay, so, so this red area is what I'll call the active piece or the active segment. Then suppose you have a word of the form u, y, x, z, v, and x is strictly less than y, and y is less than or equal to z, then you are allowed to replace, um, you're allowed to replace uh, this, uh, you're allowed to interchange x and z. So you're allowed to replace y, x, z by y, z, x, and z. So that's the first knuth relation. And the second knuth relation is, um, is uh, that if you have x, y, and z, now x is less than or equal to y, and y is strictly less than z, then you are allowed to replace u, x, z, y, v with u, z, x, y, v. So this y is sort of in both these cases, it, it's sort of um, um, protecting this x, z, and then you're allowed to interchange those two. Okay, so, so, so Knuth discovered these, um, uh, these relations uh, in the following way. He was trying to see that, suppose you have a, a tableau and you, so there's this notion of inserting a letter into the tableau. So these, you can think of each letter as an, op, uh, um, as an operator on tableau and he wanted to see uh, which different words give rise to the same operator. And that's how he came up with these two relations. And Green's proof proceeds, so, so now, um, so, so just accept these relations of Knuth and uh, Green's proof proceeds along the following lines. So the first you show that Green invariants remain unchanged under these Knuth relations. That's the first step. The second step is you show that every word can be transformed into its insertion tableau. I need to explain what it means to transform a word into the insertion tableau using Knuth moves. And uh, so, so what I mean is into the reading word of the insertion tableau. So I'll explain that in a moment. And finally, you show that if you have the reading word of an insertion tableau, then Green's theorem is easy. So you can take Green's theorem, which is easy to prove for tableau, and prove it for a general word using Knuth proofs. So that's 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 exactly how uh, Green's proof works. Okay, so in this proof, I, I think uh, the really uh, non-trivial part is the identification of the Knuth relation. The Knuth relations have to be simple enough so that you can prove that green invariants remain unchanged, but they need to be powerful enough to transform any word into the reading word of a tableau. So let me explain what the reading word of a tableau is. Maybe I should have done that earlier, but uh, anyway, any questions till now? Okay, so... Uh, if, you... I don't know if this is coming later, but uh, you, uh, the first, um, so the P, what you call the P. Yeah. Uh, 1115 in that example. Yeah, the first, yeah, P. Yeah. So uh, you had, uh, now you've given us an interpretation. I see this, let's take the third one, for example. That is the least last uh, letter of a increasing, uh, weakly increasing subword of length three, right? Yeah. Uh, are there such interpretations for uh, P prime and P double prime and P triple um. prime? 
Yeah, I think there are. Um, oh man, I yeah, I should be careful here. Um, I need to think about this carefully. I mean, it's uh, sometimes a bit subtle, but uh, one guess would be that, uh, you know, this two here, no, let, let me not say anything about that. I'll think about it and tell you later. So. Okay, okay, thanks. Okay, so, so that's the proof of Green's theorem. Uh, well, I just need to tell you what the reading word is. So this tableau itself can be thought of as a word, and uh, well, you read the tableau, but starting with the bottom row, the French are much better about this. They write the tableau upside down and then you just read it in the usual way. So this tableau corresponds to the word 5332241111. So Green's, step two in Green's proof basically says that you start with your original word, oops, uh, and you can transform it into the reading word of its tableau using a sequence of knowth relations. Okay, basically what you have to do is uh, when you're inserting, uh, uh, yeah, so maybe I'll come to that in a bit. Okay, so this, this is the classical uh, theory of, uh, you know, uh, knowth relations, um, insertion tableau, and uh, uh, Green's theorem. The plactic monoid is the free monoid modulo the Knuth relation. Okay, so um, so now uh, I'll come to the topic of this talk proper, and uh, I was trying to uh, find uh, well. So there are piecewise linear interpolations of various um, uh, various uh, co bijective correspondences involving words and tableau. And it seemed to me that a very natural way to um, think about those would be instead of using words, uh, the usual words in the usual sense, you use words where each letter can occur not once, twice, or a discrete number of times, but rather for a duration of time that is a real number. So this kind of thing has already uh, come up in the study of um, a real time uh, of formal verification theory in computer science. And uh, one of my colleagues in computer science pointed me out to this paper of Alur and Dill. Um, so in formal verification theory, a word represents a sequence of events. Okay. And uh, basically uh, a time system is a time is a is where the sequence of events occur at a certain time. So the sequence comes with timestamps. So you have a clock and it records the time when the event occurs. So it's not just what happened in what sequence, but also how long after this happened did the next thing happen. So whereas an ordinary word is just a sequence of letters, a timed word is a sequence of letters together with um, an indication of how long that letter persisted before the next letter started occurring. Okay, so we will write a timed word in the form a1 raised to t1, a2 raised to t2, al raised to tl. Here ti is a non-negative real number which represents the amount of time for which the letter ai persisted. And you can form a monoid here, a concatenation monoid, and I denoted by a and dagger, the monoid of timed words. Okay, it contains the uh, usual uh, monoid of words. As a sub monoid, uh, it just the words where these times are positive integers. Okay, so there's some maybe it's some ambiguity in the way you write these things. If a1 is equal to a2, should you add up t1 and t2 and combine it into one term and so on? You can make whatever choices you like there, but it's clear what the monoid I'm talking about here is. So um, so if you want to get rid of that, maybe you can think of, uh, well, I'll, I'll come to that in a moment. Yeah, so yeah, here it is. So a timed word can also be thought of as a right continuous piecewise constant function on uh, interval closed at zero and open at some uh, positive real number L, 
where L is the length of the time curve. So in this, uh, so this notation which I've written W equals C1 raised to T1 dot 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 CK raised to TK, I call that the exponential notation. And the length of W is just the sum of these times. And uh, you can just think of now W instead as a function uh, on this um, sort of uh, zero to length of W uh, going into the alphabet. And the value of this function at any given time t is ai if that time t lies between t1 plus dot 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 ti minus 1 and uh, t1 plus dot 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 ti. So basically, you know, it's like you start your clock and you have the letter, the value t1 until you hit t1, the c1 until you hit t1, then between t1 and t1 plus t2, you have the letter c2. And then between T1 plus T2 and T1 plus T2 plus T3, you have the letter C3 and so on. Pretty intuitive, I think. So um, now the notion of a subword. Well, uh, so basically you have this uh, function, and the subword is defined in terms of a union, a disjoint union of uh, half open uh, intervals, which are closed on the left, open on the right. So if you have uh, such a subset A1 to B1 union A2 to B2, uh, then you construct the time word by basically just ignoring, uh, you know, the, the, the parts of the original word W that do not occur in this subset S. So if you want to write this formally, then uh, um, the, the sub word corresponding to S, its value, if you think of it as a function, its value at time T is uh, the value of the original word w at the time u, which is determined by uh, requiring that the intersection with s of the interval 0 to u has um, Lebesgue measure t. OK, so inside the segment s, uh, in the original segment, you have, if you go up to u, then you have an, a length of uh, t inside the thing in the intersection with S. So this is analogous to uh, the definition of a subword uh, of an ordinary word where you just choose sub indices, uh, a subset of indices. And um, you can define uh, disjointness of subwords. You say two subwords are disjoint if the subsets from which you draw them are disjoint. So and uh, I'll talk about time rows. A time row is a weakly increasing time word. So when you think of a time word as a function, you just require that that function be weakly increasing. So, um, so now we'll talk about uh, this um, step that we talked about in Schenstedt's algorithm. Um, so we'll be reading off the segments C raised to TC, and we'll be trying to put them into uh, a row that we already have called u. And uh, so what we what we'll get is uh, okay. So here's here's the rule for defining uh, this thing called row insertion. So the inputs of this function row insertion are firstly a time row u, and just a segment of the form c raised to tc. So this is a constant uh, constant time word. And uh, if the so this u is weakly increasing, and if the if if all its values are less than or equal to c, then you just append uh, this segment c to the t c at the end of u, and you don't throw out anything. On the other hand, if this is not the case, then there is some time t such that u t is greater than c. So you take the least time, I'm sorry, you should take the least time t0 such that ut is greater than c. And then, well, this looks a little complicated. Um, maybe I'll explain it with a picture. But basically what you do is this c raised to tc, you insert it into u starting with that time t. And you throw away the corresponding segment of u. So, uh, so this is a natural extension of Schelstedt's algorithm for finding the length of the longest increasing subword. So let me uh, give you a visualization of this. So I'm going to use these kind of color maps to, uh, to uh, describe the different number letters of my alphabet. So these are uh, roughly uh, chosen by um, uh, increasing frequency of light. 
Mm. Yeah, decreasing wavelength. So, um, so suppose we want we have this. Uh, so this is uh, this thing here. Uh, uh, this piece on the left here is a row subword. Okay, the, these colors occur in the same order as they occur in this um, in this legend here. And I want to insert the segment of this color, which is corresponds to the number three. So where will this go? So what I should do is I should look, I go along this word from left to right and look for the first place where this word exceeds the number three. Now this is the place and I'm going to put this in there. And that segment of exactly that length gets displaced and thrown out and this comes to rest in there. So this is basically the row insertion algorithm of Shenstead in the time it's fairly natural if you think about it and it also has this uh, property that it will help you to find the uh, the time curve. Uh, the longest increasing row subword of your original word using one part just like Shenstead's algorithm. Okay and now we can also define the notion of a timed tableau. So a time tableau is a time word. So I'll define a time tableau as the reading word of what should be the timed analog of uh, semi-standard Young task. So it's a time word of the form UL, UL minus one dot 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 U1 such that firstly each UI is a time row. So these are the rows of the tableau. The length of U1 is greater than or equal to the length of U2 and so on. And um, at each time t, the value of uit is strictly greater than the value of the previous row ui minus 1 at the time. Okay, so this is the generalization of a semi-standard Young tableau as being weakly increasing along rows and strictly increasing along columns. So, um, so just as the insertion tableau of a word was defined as using row insertion, the timed insertion tableau of a timed word can be described using timed row insertion. So using a color map again to represent the alphabet, a timed word can be represented as a ribbon. So this here is three occurring for a certain amount of time and then uh, uh, five occurs for a very short amount of time and then two occurs and then six. So this is your you know, as your time runs along, I haven't drawn the time scale, of course, that needs to be fixed, but this is your time word. And the insertion tableau of this above time word is actually this picture I've drawn here. So I have code to compute these things. It's uh, just implementing whatever I showed you on the previous slide. So you have a word and you can turn it into a tableau. And so naturally, uh, it should be possible to prove Green's theorem in this setting. So Green's theorem does hold for time words. The main difficulty that I had in proving Green's theorem for time words was uh, to identify uh, Knuth relations. So Knuth, orig uh, Knuth original relations were this, that uh, if you have a you know piece in your word which looks like x, z, y, where x is less than or equal to y is less than z, then strictly less than z, then you can replace it by z, x, y, and vice versa. And then this other relation, which is uh, y, x, z, is y, z, x, if x is strictly less than y, less than equal to z. So uh, now in a time word, these letters can occur for uh, different amounts of time, and you need to be a little careful on when you can exchange, uh, you know, x, z, and z, x. And uh, in fact, uh, it's not quite uh, the same, it's, it's a bit different. Let me just uh, show you here uh, the actual relations that I came up with. So the smooth relations for time words, you don't assume that uh, X, Y, and Z are single letters. You assume that uh, X, Y, and Z are in fact time rows. Not only that, X, Y, Z concatenated itself is a time row. So that's like saying that X is less than or equal to Y is less than or equal to Z but I need a slightly low, stronger condition. Um, I need that length of Z is equal to length of Y. So this, um, this, uh, yeah. Yeah, length of Z is less than equal to length of Y. And the maximum value of Y is strictly less than the minimum value of Z. 
So that's, this is exactly the analog of this relation here. And the second relation that I've written down is the analog of the second relation here. So this was the uh, sort of, you know, thing that was not completely obvious, but once you see that, you know, so what we need is these relations should be simple enough so that you can prove that green invariants are preserved and they need to be powerful enough so that you can go from any word to the reading word of its insertion tab. So uh, the main step in the proof of green Sorry, Amri, can we, yeah. can, uh, yeah, that is, um, so you are saying, I mean, so this is fairly general, right? I mean, uh, meaning there are some conditions, but they could be uh, your uh, x, y, z is a time row, L, z is equal to L, y, and I mean, L, y need not be a constant, or, I mean, y need not be a constant or anything. Right, right. So in, the, in fact, this would speed up um, uh, uh, rewriting in notes uh, in, in ordinary words also. Ah, okay, okay. That was going to be my yeah. question, yeah. So you can take blocks of word letters and do Knuth relations on them. Do you have a version of this Knuth relation that still uh, that defines the same relation, but uh, somehow has only one letter in each of X, Z, and Y? Yeah, so here X, Y, and Z can have many different letters, but they have to be time rows, so they have to be big names. But do you have a version of the axiom where you have each of the, each of them as a single letter block? Um, well, you could require here that they have a single letter block, but I'm not sure if they are enough to go to the timed insertion. So uh, to go mm -hmm. from, you know, to the uh, tableau. So those may be weaker. I, I'm not, uh, I've forgotten now. Actually, I'd worked this out a little while back. Uh, yeah, if you want to work with things, See, it gets um, complicated because uh, there was one problem that can come up is uh, this, uh, you know, Euclid's algorithm for uh, finding the uh, whether two uh, lengths are commensurate or not. I think you can oh, ask some weird things like that as well. Uh, now with this, I'm sure none of that happens. Okay, because this, uh, yeah. I, I see, know. I see. Uh, but I, maybe, yeah, my... Yes, the equal length requirement is too much if you force them to be single letters. Yeah, yeah maybe. Um, but but uh, yeah, so I think single letters is, is too strong because also what happens uh, when you uh, when you do uh, an insertion, you push out something, right? Now you might insert a single letter but when you push out, the piece that you push out is not a single letter. It's actually a row subword. So even in that's this example. That's not a big deal because I can split the thing I'm inserting into pieces. Yeah, that's true. But then when you, uh, at each stage, you need to show that this process is reversible. Uh, when you try to prove, for example, something like theory's rule. And mm -hmm. then it's somehow more convenient to just work with rows and it doesn't seem to matter sometimes. I see. It works mm -hmm. very well. So, so, um, so while I'm not completely sure what happens if you only look at single letters, this is definitely a more elegant and convenient way to work with things. Um, that Euclid's problem may be commensurate. I'm not sure. So, Okay, so that's uh, so. So the main step in the proof of Green's theorem originally, and in the proof of the time version of Green's theorem, is to show that if two words differ by a Knuth move, then they have the same uh, Green invariance. Okay, so let me recall the proof in the uh, classical case. It's very cute. Um, so I have these two words. Uh, you know, so let's look at one of these relations. I think this is the second relation. Uh, yeah, it's the second relation. Uh, no, it's the first relation. Okay. So it's the first relation. And uh, I have a word WXZYU and I have the word WZXYU. 
and i want to say that whenever i have a disjoint union of k um, row subwords of one of these of a certain length i also have a disjoint union of k uh, row subwords of the other one so if i have of this i have of this so for example if i have a row subword of the form w prime z u prime where w prime is a row subword of w and u prime is a row subword of u then of course it's also a row subword on this side because you know it only involves z and you know nothing has really changed uh, similarly if i have a row subword of which only uses x and y then it's not a problem uh, it's a row subword on both sides because the relative positions of x and y have not changed under the closed relationship the real problem arises when you ha have used both x and z over here okay so if you've used both x and z over here you cannot write w prime x z u prime that's not a subword of the word on the right hand side but it's very easy to fix that you just take the z out and replace it by y but remember when we are computing truth in uh, green invariants we are not just looking at one subword we're looking at uh, k different subwords so what if we have a bunch of uh, disjoint subwords and one of them has x z and the other has y then i can't take this and replace it by w prime x y u prime uh, because what would i do with the z well i might try to put w double prime z u prime but that may not work because all i know is that y u prime is weakly increasing but z being strictly larger than y um it may not be that z u double prime is strictly increasing so there's this very cute trick where you just take w prime x y u double prime and w double prime z u prime and this works you just swap these two last segments okay so that's that's the proof in the classical case and uh, the proof in the time case is similar but slightly more complicated so uh, we'll take the same the analog of that relation and we have a word now a time word w x z y u and we have its counterpart w z x y u and all these conditions are satisfied and now i have k time row subwords of the word on the left which realize the kth green invariant so these are all row subwords they are disjoint their total length is ak and uh, i want to know what i can do on this side there are a few cases to consider i'm just actually going to give you this whole proof because this is the heart of the whole thing so suppose all the xis were uh, the empty words so so okay so firstly why have i written these like these like this so if you have a row subword of w x z y u it cannot contain both uh, it cannot contain all three of x z and y it will either contain x and z segments from uh, x and z or segments from x and y you cannot have all three so any subword will be of the form w1 x1 z1 u1 where x1 is a sub row subword of x z1 is a row subword of z or it will be of the form w r plus 1 x r plus 1 y r plus 1 u r plus 1 so so either you have an x z or an x y so i have just collected all the sub row subwords which have x and z as the first r subwords and the remaining k minus r i have taken the ones which have x and y okay so so given any arbitrary collection of k time rows this joint pairwise this joint row subwords which realize the kth green invariant i'll just organize them in this manner i'll write the words which have x and z first and i'll write the words which have x and y next it's of course possible that some words have uh, neither z nor y but you put them in either either family and uh, so you just take all the words which have z first and then all the words which have y next if they have neither y nor z you put them in either family okay so now we'll consider some cases so firstly if these words which have z don't have any x then uh, what do you do well uh, then uh, there's no problem uh, there's no x here so so you know there's no uh, problem caused by interchanging z and x you just take these same words uh, there's no x in them so they remain row subwords 
and uh, you find k pairwise disjoint time subwords of this word on the right, which realize the same, uh, which have the same total length. Okay, so that's the case when all the the first r xi's are zero. Now suppose the yi's are zero for these last k minus r words. So suppose the y's don't occur at all, then uh, you what you can do is uh, you can just take this. Uh, uh, you can just take uh, w. Uh, x1 y u1 so you just replace uh, this first word by x1 y u1 you take x2 z2 and just replace it by x2 and uh, so on and here you just uh, you know um, these y's are anyway zero so you just uh, have these words and what you'll see is that now this the problem here was that you know you couldn't have zx but you have just replaced it by x z by x y and the length of y is greater than or equal to is less than the length of z oh no the length of y is equal to the length of z which is greater than or equal to uh, the length of z1 plus the length of z2 plus dot 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 the length of zr so this so this these words on the right hand side totally give you at least as much as the total length of these words and that's the direction in which uh, the inequality is hard to prove. The other way around is easy because every increasing subword here is an increasing subword here. And then the hardest case is when, uh, well, let's assume that x1 is non-empty, at least one of these is non-empty, and at least one of these y's is non-empty. Let's say yk is non-empty. Uh, I'll come to this in a minute. So, so you have these uh, x1, x2, some of them are non-empty. I know that x1 is non-empty. Now, among all these x1, x2, and xr, I will look for the, I'll assume that x1 is the one with the smallest minimum value. And I'll assume that yk is the one with the largest maximum value. And now, the trick is, what you do is you construct these new words called x0 and y0. So, what is x0? You have these segments, x uh, subwords, x1, x2, xr, they all are drawn from x. So they're drawn from certain subsets of the time range of x. You just take the union of all those time ranges and take the corresponding subword, call it x0. So the total length of x0 is the length of x1 plus the length of x2 plus dot 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 the length of xr. And similarly, you take all these y's and put them together and create this word y0. And uh, now here you see this uh, swap that we had in the original proof. You replace w1 x1 z1 by w1 x0 y0, but instead of u1, you put uk. And this is where I needed this condition that uh, max of yk is greater than max of yi for all i. Um, this uk, this ensures that this is a row subword. So that those are the three cases using which it's a little more complicated, but it's basically the same idea to prove uh, that um, the green invariants are preserved under the timed versions of uh, range. And uh, a lot of uh, things that you do with ordinary words are easy to do here. You can prove the timed theory rules. So a timed row I already defined. Uh, let me define a timed column. A timed column is a timed word of the form n raised to a n n minus one raised to a n minus one dot 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 uh, down to one raised to a one, where these numbers a one a two a n are strict are, are between zero and one, so they could also be zero. So basically, it's a word. It's the analog of a strictly decreasing uh, word, which we call a column in in classical tableau theory. And uh, let r dagger a n and c dagger and denote the sets of timed rows and timed columns respectively. So the Peary rules are just the, uh, the same as in the case of ordinary tableau. Uh, you get a bijection between tab, uh, so insertions, you can take a, you can take a, 
time tableau, insert a row into it, and you'll get another time tableau. The difference in shapes between these two time tableau is going to be a horizontal strip. But when you insert a column, the difference in shapes is going to be a vertical strip. And uh, using these two, uh, you can do the piece, piecewise linear interpolation of the RSK correspondence. So, um, so uh, maybe you can ignore this. This is from some old slide I had. So, so uh, matrices with non-negative real entries are in bijective correspondence with pairs of time tableau of the same shape. Here's an example. Uh, you have this matrix here, and uh, these are the tableau that you get. Okay, so uh, I have, uh, it's easy to run this with code. Uh, more interestingly is the dual RSK correspondence. So this uses the second Peary rule about compositions. So normally the dual RSK correspondence says that if you have a zero one matrix, uh, then it is in bijective correspondence with a pair of semi-standard young tableau the, whose shapes are mutually conjugate. But here you can't get this actually. This is one of the uh, difficulties I'm facing with this theory that what you get in this case is once, on the one hand, you just get a time tableau, but on the other hand, you don't get another time tableau of conjugate shape, whatever that would mean in fact, it's not clear what conjugate of a real partition is. Uh, you get what I call a dual tableau. So a dual tableau is a tableau where um, the rows are uh, in some sense strictly increasing. That is, uh, each number occurs uh, with multiple uh, with uh, with time stamp uh, less than or equal to one, and the numbers strictly increase. And then along columns, it is a weakly increasing condition. So this here on the left hand side is what is called a dual tableau. And uh, and what you get is a piecewise linear um, a bijection from what is called the Gale riser polytope, the polytope of um, um, of um, matrices whose entries are between zero and one onto the set of pairs P comma Q, where P is a dual time tableau and Q is a time tableau. And P and Q have the same shape. So this is uh, very tantalizing and uh, this uh, brings me to um, issue that I have not been able to resolve, which I feel must have uh, a, a resolution. I'm just not seeing it. So, um, so there's a there's a beautiful theorem called Green's duality theorem. So, given a word, uh, an ordinary word, um, you know, classical word, you define a dual Green invariant. It's the maximum sum of lengths of k pairwise disjoint column subwords. That means strictly decreasing subwords. And Green's duality theorem says. That if you say if you let mu k be the differences, successive differences of the b k, and lambda k to be the successive differences of the a k, then these mu and lambda are mutually conjugate partitions. So that's Green's duality theorem, and uh, the problem that uh, I'm stuck with here is to formulate and prove Green's duality theorem for timed words, and the stumbling block is that. Um, a dual tableau is not the conjugate of a semi-standard Young tableau. Okay, so that more or less is uh, all I had to say. Um, so you can feel free to ask questions if any. Um, Oh yeah, so this stuff is in a preprint. I think I've given it in the abstract. So is there an identity that analogous to the Cauchy formula that you get? Maybe it's an integral identity? Oh, that's a very good question. In fact, uh, yeah, I'm... I, I know Dari maybe has some has thought about this. Sorry about what? 
Uh, so Arvind is asking if there is, uh, you know, there are these Cauchy identities, which uh, the RSK correspondence corresponds to a Cauchy identity. Uh, uh, so bijection between. Um, so is there something using uh, for using time tableau or continuous, you know, piecewise linear or polytope sort of thing? I mean, there is a lot of work by probability theorists on this, but I never, I don't understand any of that. Some of it might be related. Oh, by whom? By probability theorists. Yeah, but uh, like then, like Arvind Iyer. No, no. Yes, but well, uh, I think, for example, Nico Ziguros has a has an introduction that I'm I want to read for ages now. Uh, some algebraic structures on the KPZ universality, and I think it has some integral analogs of Cauchy form Cauchy's formula. I don't know what they are. Can you type the guy's name? I didn't quite. Yeah, I can. I can type the link in. Oh yeah, that would be great. Oh, I see. Thanks. Yeah. So, um, uh, and also there's this uh, well-known blog post of Terence Tau where he talks about continuous analogs of Schur functions. So these are defined as uh, integrals over Gelfand-Zetlin polytopes, uh, whereas classical Schur functions are just sums over uh, semi-standard Young tableau. So, um, yeah. And these piecewise, these, um, you know, continuous interpolations of uh, correspondences do give rise to uh, uh, area preserving uh, piecewise linear bijective correspondence. These are the poly, polytopic models of various bijective correspondences. This is not something that you need time tableau for, but time tableau give you a more organic uh, way to do this. Um, another thing is that crystal theory as developed by Littleman, is it, the, the way Littleman develops his crystal theory, it's completely like, uh, you know, continuous in the sense you can have fractional crystal operators and so on. So crystal theory is well developed for um, uh, timed words, but uh, the knuth equivalence and so on, that was missing. So this fills in that side of the story. So you have coplectic operations from the crystal theory and you have your Knut equivalence. Is there again a commuting square between the two? Um, yeah, I, I think so, yeah. Because I think a lot, a lot follows from that commuting square if you somehow know to use it well. Exactly, I mean, for example, to start with the Littlewood Richardson rule. Yeah. yeah. So the one difficulty is uh, I'm not very good at integrating over GT polytopes and I don't know how to integrate over uh, time tableau exactly. So, Amri, Amri, can I ask you a question? Yeah. Um, I thought maybe this is related to this issue with the Cauchy formula, but I mean, if, if, is there a way of, um, so you said that the standard, your version of time standard tableau corresponds to taking all of the time increments less than or equal to one? Uh, sorry, uh, I, I didn't catch that. Can you get closer to the mic? Your voice is not very clear. Sorry. I, you, you said something about, maybe I missed, uh, that the, the timed version of standard tableau would be taking all of the time increments less than or equal to one? Uh, no, not standard tableau. I call them dual tableau. So this guy here on the left. Right, okay. Right. So I, uh, I was so wondering if there's, a, if there's a kind of good analog of standard tableau. And if so, can you make a kind of, is there some way of fixing the, the boundary and then, and then making an analog of a hook length formula? So aren't standard tableau Tableau, like in the classical case, they are tableau and dual tableau at the same time, mm -hmm. right? Um, in the sense that they are weakly increasing along rows and strictly increasing along columns. Also, they are strictly increasing along rows and weakly increasing along columns. I mean, they're, they satisfy both these conditions. So they are strictly increasing along rows and strictly increasing along columns. 
So uh, if you take the intersection of these two, then I think you would just probably, ha, huh, so what would you get? Yeah, then maybe there is something interesting. Well, maybe, actually, maybe more, uh, another way, of, maybe another version of this would be. No, but yeah, no, what you said, you there is some. Just, just consider time to flow, but somehow fix the perimeter, fix the. Fix no, no, so I think what it is, is you would want each row that each let is weakly increasing, but no letter occurs for longer than uh, one second. And along each vertical, it is strictly increasing. I mean, that would be a standard tableau in some sense. But uh, standard so tableau are so nice, right? Because the numbers form a permutation. Would there be some analog of that here? I mean. Well, I, I, my question was more, is, it, is there some sort of volume measure? For these if you somehow fix the print, fix the shape and look at the various continuous fillings of this. Mm -hmm. We have some kind of uh, nice measure formula, which would... So one way to uh, get the volume is to just integrate on the GT polytope, which has a, a volume form. Is that what uh -huh. you're talking about? I, it might be. Yeah. I mean, what we're trying to say, instead of counting standard tableau, there's some nice. Yeah. And, uh, oh yeah, I must say that uh, uh, I owe a lot to Dari for, um, uh, he read my preprint and found a couple of uh, mistakes. Uh, one of them was kind of serious in the proof of that main part of the Green's theorem, which I then fixed. So thank you, Dari. Well, you're welcome. I wasn't aware of it being serious, so. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I kind of had the right idea or I hadn't written it right and it was wrong. I mean, the proof I've written was wrong. So. What happens when you take, uh, in your RSK, your, your timed RSK, when you take pairs, which, um, I mean, is there an analog of this result where you take um, two tableau of the same shape and it corresponds to an involution on the side of the symmetric. Yeah, yeah, that you can do. So here you can just take this matrix and transpose it and it will interchange these two tableaux. And what is the resulting real matrix that you get? Does it have some? It's the same. Property? You transpose the matrix, you swap the tableau. And uh, for this one, I don't know, it's not so well known. There's a 90 degree rotation business, but uh, I, again, so, so that works for uh, zero one matrices, but it's not clear how to make it work for you. So the dual RSK correspondence is sort of the uh, neglected, uh, but more fascinating brother of the RSK correspondence. And it has a symmetry property, which is a rotation by 90 degrees. Um, so if you have P comma Q corresponding to matrix and you rotate the matrix by 90 degrees, then you get, uh, I think maybe the Schutzenberger involute of Q and uh, something they, they get, you know, interchanged. It's, it's, it's very interesting. I have this written down somewhere. And uh, here, so, yeah, it's, it's not clear exactly. These are all hints that there should be a green uh, a duality theory here also. Me too. Hi, uh, I'm 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 Rit or I'm Rit. Amrit. Uh, Amrit. Hi. Uh, uh, thank you for the talk. Uh, I I was wondering if there was uh, a notion of a skew timed tableau or a jeu de taquin. Uh, sure, the skew timed tableau, um, but uh, jeu de taquin. Uh, yeah, I, I didn't uh, try to think about, I, I, like, I tried to think about it for a bit in the beginning that way, but uh, it was not working out. So I just then stuck to working with this, but I, I don't know that there isn't. So um, the thing is the pieces are all of different si sizes, right? So, um, so how would you, um, when you slide, you would get weird situations, but maybe, maybe you can do it. A great question, uh, Gabriel. Uh, uh, yeah, Gabe. Gabe, okay. Um, or so, so I guess a, a skew time tableau that just 
you would just sort of say that there's some initial interval where there isn't anything that I guess that's right, right. You would do. It's just a skew shape, yeah. But then it would be. I, I see. You'd have to come up with some way of choosing whole lengths that you would be trying to. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I don't know. I guess it is it seems complicated. Yeah, but one of the things you know, so it's also an objection to having this theory is that, well, you know, if you have ordinary words, you can always like uh, um, take take repeat each letter in the word a hundred times. And then if you want fractional things, certainly rational words with rational timestamps can be uh, replaced by um, ordinary words. And so in some sense, the ordinary plactic theory should uh, give you, uh, uh, you know, by approximation and density results, somehow this time theory. But, um, but then you lose the duality there because when you, duality is not scaling invariant. So duality is somehow the thing, and if I can do that, something or understand that, I'd be happy. I, I guess I had I, I had one other sort of maybe related question, which is so. Uh, so you were talking about this ninety degree rotation for the dual correspondence, but huh? if you do the one hundred eighty degree rotation for the then normal correspondence. And and so what what does that correspond to on the timed tableau? Uh, it's a, there's a Schutzenbergian involution on timed words, uh, and on timed tableau. So like what you do is if you have a word, you reverse the order of the letters, but then you also reverse the order in which the letters appear. Right. Is there a direct description on the timed tableau though, like some sort of evacuation kind of procedure? Is there any way to do that? I know I've just been thinking, you know, you, you do this shits and Berger and then you, uh, maybe there is again, but yeah, some of these stepwise things don't work so well. Um, uh -huh. yeah. Like you don't have any growth diagram kind of you know, yeah. thing here. Though there are maybe semi-standard versions of growth diagrams. I don't know. I mean, there's some. Yeah, there, there are definitely semi-standard versions of growth adding diagrams. Adding horizontal yeah. strips instead of um, adding boxes. So, uh, but then can you describe the Schutzenberger involution in those terms? It's not something. Sure. Yeah, I mean, I think I think that what ends up, so when you're doing the Schutzenberger involution by that, that triangle, uh, I think when, when you're doing the semi-standard version, I think what the, the steps end up being these Bender-Knuth involutions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Yeah, so if you had some version of Bender Knuth involution that would that would interchange the i's and i plus ones, mm. that would be that would be nice. Yeah, the idea of giving this talk is I wanted to dust. This has been sort of sitting uh, for a couple of years. I wanted to dust it off and start working on it. Yeah, and. Uh, yeah, some people seem to think that it was worth sort of doing something with. So I feel motivated again to <laughs> work on it again. Um, yeah, I, I think this is this is a nice a, a nice way of thinking about some of this piecewise linear. Yeah, so people stuff. have other ways to get to the piecewise linear things. It's not that is not new. The piecewise linear stuff. So anyway, I guess any more questions? Uh, 